Yellowstone is one of my favorite places in the whole world. I grew up right near Yellowstone. I've been there dozens and dozens of times. I remember as a child driving through Yellowstone Park, actually when the fire was raging, you could see the smoke and the flames in the background as we're driving out. It's one of my iconic childhood memories. And I'm a former backcountry ranger for the National Park Service. For several years, I worked uh, in Olympic National Park as a ranger. I had kind of first-hand experience working in parks, and now I get to research. As a child, my parents would drive through Yellowstone, and I was uh, there when you could feed bears, and you would put little morsels out the crack in the window, hoping they couldn't get in. I have had it, boo-boo. I'm gonna bust out of here. How come, Yogi? Every day, it's the same old thing. Look at the bears, look at the bears, look at the bears. Sheesh. Hey, Pop! Look at the bears, look at the bears! and you counted the number of black bears that you saw as you drove through, and if you didn't get into the upper 20s, it was a bad day. We often think of Yellowstone as the prime example of wilderness in America, but day to day the park is actually managed by a government bureaucracy. Ecology can tell us how organisms interact with one another in their environment, but ecology can't tell us the best way to manage a park. Choosing the best way is a political decision, not a scientific one. If I look at the history of how Yellowstone was managed, it was managed by Indians if it was managed at all. Native Americans lived there in Yellowstone and other parks. They burned off trees to create prairie or, or grasslands uh, to attract wildlife. But Yellowstone was not a very productive place. It was a harsh place in the winter. There weren't bison there in those days. So Yellowstone was not a place where Indians spent a lot of time. Once Yellowstone was discovered by the, the white man, people began to say, wow, Oh, this is a pretty interesting place. Uh, we think of the park as just being created by kind of people deciding we needed a park. It actually wasn't. It was railroads that decided through kind of entrepreneurial vision that the park was a valuable resource and it was really valuable for viewing rather than production. And so the Northern Pacific Railroad that was very instrumental in getting it created in 1872, that was because they had put a lot of money into an exploratory trip to the park and they said it needs to be protected. When Congress first set up Yellowstone as a national park, there was no real agency to manage it. So the Department of Interior started managing it, but they didn't really have any funding, they didn't really have much guidance. By 1886, the Army came in to help manage the park. The Army helped limit some poaching, but not everything went well. By 1916, Congress created the National Park Service Organic Act, which set up the National Park Service to kind of oversee all of the national parks and monuments in the United States. I like to emphasize with the Park Service celebrating its 100th anniversary, that was 44 years after Yellowstone was created. So the National Park Service was not a glint in the eye of the bureaucrats in Washington when Yellowstone was formed. But this law was problematic because of this contradictory mandate within the law. The law says that the National Park Service has to preserve the parks and monuments unimpaired for future generations, but the Park Service also has to promote recreation. So when you have these two things, they can kind of go head to head. Rather than good intentions leading to good outcomes, politics got involved. And anytime politics gets involved, the good intentions get murkier, the good policy gets driven by political outcomes, by folks that have something to win or lose. The prime example of unintended consequences in Yellowstone is happening on the Northern Range. The Northern Range is an area of Yellowstone that's uh, essentially high grazing lands. And one of the things that we've seen happen is that as you've seen increased numbers of elk due to the political management going on in Yellowstone, the conditions on the Northern Range have deteriorated. The range has changed from what were the traditional native species that were growing there to much more invasive species in large part due to the overgrazing that's happened because elk numbers had risen so high due to the way the park was managed. The National Park Service set up exclosures throughout the park about 40 to 50 years ago to study the effects of grazers like elk and bison. These exclosures show that the aspen and willows are having a difficult time regrowing outside the exclosures. You can see along the fence line that there's a stark difference. On the inside of the fence is a lush, dense aspen grove, and on the outside is a grassland with grass only a few inches tall. They were preserving the elk and bison from being killed. 
At the same time, they were actively exterminating predators like mountain lions and wolves from the park, so the bison and elk populations grew exponentially. They were clearly overstocking the range, and the elk were decimating willow populations. Willows were the main food source and material for beaver dams and beavers uh, eating. And without willows, it meant no beaver dams. Without beaver dams, there was nothing to check the spring flow of water. Without the checking of spring flows of water, there was no creation of ponds and, and backwaters that, that then filled up with silt and became really good habitat for songbirds. And the list just goes on and on. By the time the National Park Service came around in 1916, they started noticing that the huge elk populations were overgrazing, so they started a program of relocating elk outside the park. They also started actively killing elk in the park to keep the population slow enough so it wouldn't overgraze everything. And so early on, the Park Service tried to manage the elk herds by shooting them. And they would shoot a number of elk and haul them out to uh, prisons and Indian reservations and and give away the carcasses. And again, that created a hue and cry from the uh, even the early on uh, animal rights people who didn't think that was an appropriate way to manage the park. The National Park Service decided to stop all direct elk management. They asserted that the elk population would just naturally regulate itself. It would just find a balance. But what actually ended up happening is the elk population got really huge and so the Park Service again had its hands tied and, and it was a question of so what's the optimal number of elk? How many should there be? And If you're going to limit it because you want to have more willows then how do you get rid of them? And so the answer was the wolf. When the wolf was reintroduced there was this belief that it was just the last missing link in the ecosystem and that once we restored that link the ecosystem would be whole and would be in balance again. And I, I recall sitting one day with an, a, a, an assistant superintendent at Yellowstone. I remember her vividly saying that the wolf is the last missing link in the ecosystem. And you hear that and there's this image again of this puzzle and it's just, ah, I have the last piece, can I put it in? And, and she was convinced that by putting that piece in the puzzle, now we would have a balanced ecosystem. All would be well. When you're driving through Lamar Valley, you can pull over on the side of the road and there's a sign called the Wolf Effect. On the sign it shows a beautiful scene of how wolves have restored Yellowstone's ecology. What's funny is if you look up directly from the sign, you can see that reality doesn't look like anything what the sign shows. Along a few of the waterways on the northern range of Yellowstone, Wolves have helped to restore some of the ecology. Some of the willows and aspens are starting to regrow, but throughout a majority of the park, willows and aspens are still being overgrazed and they're having a hard time regrowing. They put the 19 wolves in and when they turned them loose from the pens where they got them uh, fed and, and uh, acclimatized, uh, they looked out and said, holy cow, this is easy pickings. There were uh, around 20,000 elk in the northern range at that time where they released the wolves and they found it easy pickings. The wolf population skyrocketed, the elk population plummeted. Today they're an estimated 4,000 rather than 20,000. Well, if you go to Yellowstone today, you'll find lots more willows. You'll find lots more aspen trees. One thing you don't like if you're fly fishing is brush behind you for your back cast. Well, when the elk were there, you didn't have to worry about that. Today, you're getting tangled all the time. So maybe we have too many if you're a fisherman. The people who hunt, however, aren't so happy because now there aren't as many coming out of Yellowstone in the, in the winter, so the hunting isn't as good. The issue is tough because we I think everybody has a different preference about what they want Yellowstone to be. And that may be one that has lots of bison or lots of wolves or lots of elk. But it's hard to use any sort of scientific justification for what that ought to be, or any ecological justification for what that ought to be. If, we're, if our goal is to be a place where people come to see the iconic scenery, there will be trade-offs in doing that. There will, be, there will be costs. Yellowstone, despite the myth, is not today a wild place. It is fundamentally a manufactured place. What we're really seeing is that science doesn't provide a whole lot of guidance for these questions. They really come down to human preferences and human values. And so the ultimate question is how do those human values and preferences express themselves through different uh, institutions, political institutions and legal institutions to, to influence what that management outcome is.
So it's a classic case of just how difficult it is to manage a public resource in light of this democracy notion that, that uh, uh, we the people should have some input. And, and so we the people, does that mean the wolf lovers? Does that mean the hunters? Uh, does that mean the fishers? Uh, who, who are the people and how do you balance all of these interests? It was just a, a, a nightmare for, for park managers.